How about this morning we had 20 people take their next step of baptism? Take a look on the screen. We got some pictures from that this morning. This is what's really cool about this, man. We had, we had kids from our kids' ministry, students from our student ministry. We had families. We had people from Celebrate Recovery, people from all the different ministries of our church uh, taking their next steps, young adults getting baptized. And I'm just telling you, man, uh, God is radically changing people's lives, people's families. And it was really cool because I got to see uh, somebody baptized this morning, somebody that they actually led to Christ here this past year. And so that's a really cool experience. And uh, your generosity, your serving, all the different things you're doing to make a difference here at Relevant Church does not go unnoticed. So uh, let's jump into today's conversation. Um, don't tell my doctor I'm walking. Um, I'll get in trouble. Uh, and uh, well, don't tell him I'm walking about the boot. That's what. But the boot's really uncomfortable. But uh, I, I, uh, I really want to stand up and preach this message. I'm not going to lie to you. So uh, I can't, and, uh, but, but, I, but I really want to because I think God's going to speak uh, really clearly to some people today. Um, this past week, I was at a location uh, in town, and um, I, I don't know, I made a comment about something. A lady said, uh, so are, are you a pastor? And I said, yeah. And she said, where, where are you the pastor at? And I said, Relevant Church. And she goes, oh, I, I didn't. She said, I, I, I know who you are now. And I said, okay, well, what? She said, where's the church? Now, keep in mind, we're two miles from here. She said, I watch online all the time. I didn't know the church was in our hometown. To which I said, why are these people, why are y'all not inviting people? That was my response. No, I'm just kidding. So I really thought to myself, she said, I ride by there all the time. I didn't even realize. Here's what I know. What I've learned in life is you can be so close to something and not even know it. Not even know it. So close to something, yet it can be so invisible. Can I, can I propose to you that that doesn't mean it's not there? See, I believe so many of us uh, in America and in our community and even in our church, we're missing the power of God, and it's right in front of us. We're missing what Jesus did and the power that we can live in but it's literally right in front of us. So Jesus dies on Friday. We know if you're a follower of Jesus, you understand that everything we do, everything we believe hinges on a resurrection. Without a resurrection, we, we should just give it all up. The scripture tells us it is futile without a resurrection. And so if Jesus didn't uh, raise from the dead, then nothing else matters. And so we know on Sunday that some ladies went to the tomb and he was gone. The stone was rolled away. And now Jesus... He gone. We're going to do an Easter series a few years back, and they talked me out of it. And the whole title was going to be, He Gone. But they talked me out of it. <laughs> um, and they're wondering where he's at. And now Jesus has 40 days here on this earth to tell everybody, like, hey, yo, I'm, I'm alive. Now, if I have 40 days on day one coming out of the tomb, on day one coming out of the tomb where I've just taken, Jesus takes the uh, the lashes on his back, he hangs on a cross, he becomes the substitution for you and I for our sins, and he, he pays the penalty we should have paid, and he goes into a tomb, and he defeats death, hell, and the grave. You, you come out on day one, how are you, where are you going to go? I mean, maybe I think I would probably do a reenactment in the city center to show everybody, look, y'all thought you had me, but look at what happened. Maybe you should get Zuckerberg or Elon to tweet about it, you know, like let the world know what happened so that, you know, if you can just get an influencer. But no, that's not what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't look for the city centers, the crowds. He doesn't look for the most influential people. What he does, he actually takes a walk. On day one of the tomb, he takes a walk and he meets up with two travelers. And we, up until this point, we never even heard their name. And he's actually going toward Emmaus, which is a seven-mile journey from Jerusalem. Emmaus is such an insignificant place that today they have to guess where it was. There's no archaeological facts that would prove its exact location. So why would Jesus go, go there? Why would Jesus go? See, I think we look for God so many times. We look for Jesus uh, in a significant place, as if he needs a shout out from Kanye. As if he needs a shout out from somebody. He's not walking with Trump. He's not walking with Kanye. He's not walking with Elon. He's not walking. These are two people. And up until this point, we don't even know their name. 
And he's walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jerusalem is where the Holy Spirit's going to fall in the book of Acts. Jerusalem was where the church is going to launch and change the world. He's walking away from the spiritual center toward this place called Emmaus. And he's walking with two disciples that we don't know up until this point. And listen to me. This is funny to me. And I don't care if you don't think it's funny. I think it's funny. One of them's name was Cleopas. And we don't even know the other one's name. Some scholars think it might be his wife, so we'll say Miss Cleo. Some scholars think it just may be another male disciple. We don't really know. But when I read the Bible, there are stories in the Bible that I look at and I am go, man, this is, this is really wild. I can't believe that it really went down like this. And so it begins to play itself out in my head with kind of a sense of humor. You ever read something and you're like, oh, and you envision it like as a cartoon almost? Because these two can't be this dumb. They can't. So what I thought I would do briefly is we'll give you a glimpse here. We got a couple people going to give you a little bit of a twist, maybe a modern day twist, super off the wall, just how it might play out in my head, okay? That same day, two other disciples, not of the eleven, are traveling the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. As they walk along, they talk back and forth about all that has transpired during recent days. While they're talking, discussing, chit-chatting, and conversing, Jesus catches up to them and begins walking with them. But for some reason, they don't even recognize him. You two seem awfully chatty. What are you talking about? They stop walking, stand there, and just look sad. One of them, Cleopas, yes, Cleopas is his name, speaks up. Well, uh... Hello to you too, sir. I'm Cleopas. Are you new here? This has been going on for quite some time now. You must be living under a rock or something. <gasps> Are you not on the socials? The Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook Marketplace, the YouTube, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitch, Zoom, FarmersOnly.com? Okay, okay. What are you talking about? Once again, you're not on social media, so you wouldn't know. So there's this guy named Jesus. He's from Nazareth. And he's only like the biggest influencer. And he has preached some pretty fire messages for anyone and everyone to hear. Like Cleopas said, you must really live under a rock. Let me at least set you up with a Twitter account so you can be in the know. Well, the authorities and religious leaders gave him over to be killed. Nailed to a cross, to be frank. We thought he was the one, you know. The one who would come to save us all and bring God's promise to earth. Anywho, there were some women that we know that shook us to the core this morning. Keep in mind, it was only the third day after Jesus was led to be put to death. Early this morning, the women went to Jesus' tomb. And you're not going to believe this, but they couldn't find his body. But, and hang on to your seat for this one, they said they saw visions of heavenly messengers. These messengers told them that Jesus was still alive. And for good reason, the rest of the group had to go and check. And wouldn't you know it, Jesus wasn't there. Men, why are you being so foolish? Why are your hearts callous towards what the prophets have been saying all along? Didn't the Messiah have to experience these sufferings in order for you to come into his glory? Then Jesus begins with Moses and continues, prophet by prophet, explaining the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures, showing how they were talking about the very things that had happened to Jesus. About this time, they are nearing their destination. Jesus keeps walking ahead as if he has no plans to stop there, but they convince him to join them. Uh, excuse me, uh, you should probably come with us now. It's getting awfully dark out here and we shouldn't walk these roads. The sun's getting real low. So he decides to accompany them to their home. When they sit down at the table for dinner, he takes the bread in his hands. He gives thanks for it, and then he breaks it and hands it to them. At that instant, two things happen. Their eyes are suddenly open, and they recognize him, and then he instantly vanishes, just disappears before their eyes. Wow, did you feel different when he was talking to us earlier? He definitely had a presence about him. Oh, absolutely. I felt the Holy Spirit moving through my veins, I did. No wonder it all started to make sense when he was explaining the Bible. <laughs> Should have known. Big facts. <laughs> so, first of all, the guy's name's Cleopas. So, 
I illustrate this only because I want you to see how ridiculous yet radical at the same time this interaction was. My hope is that by the end of today's conversation, I don't just preach a message and walk you through a, a scripture, but now you'll remember how could two people who were walking and talking and standing with Jesus totally not recognize him? Uh, can I just propose to you today that that's many of us in this room? Jesus has tried to show up in your life on so many occasions, and maybe you've missed it. Because when Jesus shows up, everything changes. You know that, right? When you see him clearly for who he is, when you don't see him as a coloring sheet on a page with a lamb in his lap in 1D, when you see Jesus in 3D, when you see him for all that he is, it changes you. Everything changes. So I just want to give you a title of today's message. Some of y'all already had your 3D glasses on thinking everything was going to be in 3D. We are not that creative. <laughs> y'all, y'all just, so here it is. Jesus in 3D. Now, I'm going to give you three Ds today that are going to help you understand, but I want you to take your glasses off. You already got your glasses ready. Look, so to put your glasses on, you put them on. All right, so here's the thing. We got to um, make sure everybody has them on. Uh, I just want to watch y'all. <laughs> this is my entertainment right now. So we got a couple videos we want to show you right now and uh, let them go for a few minutes. And then uh, I-, I want you to just observe what's different about what you see with the glasses versus without the glasses. Go ahead. Here we go. Hit that first one. Some of y'all swatting them away like they're bugs. <laughs> Others of y'all trying to catch them in your mouth. All right, here we go. Next video. Watch this. Safe. All right, so now... That's all we got. Take them off. <laughs> what, what? I mean, think of, I saw, literally see you, you're sitting there, and as it, like, you see things from a different dimension, don't you? I don't know if you've ever been to a 3D movie, uh, uh, but it, it changes things. With, with the glasses, you see things that you cannot see. You see it in dimensions you cannot see without it. And I actually think there's a lot of things that are similar in this text that we have today. And so I want to give you just a couple thoughts today briefly Uh, So maybe you can begin to see Jesus in a different dimension, in a different perspective. Luke chapter number 24, beginning in verse number 13, says this. Now that same day, what day? Resurrection Sunday. After Jesus leaves the tomb, it says uh, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. You saw this in our our little reenactment. But what had happened? Let's talk about what had happened. Earlier that morning, Mary and some ladies went to the tomb to look for Jesus. They were taking spices to the tomb, and they look up, and the stone's been rolled away. He's gone. He's no longer there. And two angels, two messengers from God appear and literally say this, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead. Can I just pause for a minute and say that there are so many people in our world today, in our community today, your neighbors, your friends, your family, maybe even some of you, you are looking for things that only lead to death. You're looking for life in things that only lead to death. You thought that relationship would bring you life. It didn't. You thought that substance would bring you life. It didn't. You thought that addiction would fill the void, and it didn't. It only brought depression and death. You thought if you could just have more money, more friends, more whatever, a bigger house, more stuff, you are looking for life in dead places. This is why we show up. I'm I'm not poking fun, but hear me. This is why we come on Easter because we're supposed to. And we come on Christmas because we're supposed to. But 50 other weeks out of the year, we look for fulfillment in other ways. Because we don't make Jesus the center of our life because we don't realize he is the source of life. It goes on to say, as they walked, they discussed these things with each other. And Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. The day the resurrected Son of God comes out of the tomb, he appears to two random people on a road walking away from the spiritual center of the world. 
says they were kept from recognizing him. We don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know if this was Jesus. But I think you're going to see something at the end on when and how I believe they recognized him. It says he asked them. (laughs) This is funny. Jesus asking like he don't know. What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Now, just the irony of this moment. The resurrection standing in front of them, but they're still focused on death. They're sad. One of them named Cleopas said, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who do not know the things that have happened here the last few days? You understand the irony. He's asking the person that the whole story is about, the whole event that would change history is, are you not aware of what's going on? The one who took the 39 lashes on his back because the 40th lash was considered the death blow. The one who would carry his own cross up a hill, put a crown of thorns in his head, hang on the cross for the sins of the entire world, and at the end, look out and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Cleopas has the audacity to say, don't you know what's going on? Have you ever looked at God and said, come on, God, do you not see me? Do you not see what I'm going through? Can I just tell you this Easter Sunday morning, God is fully aware of your circumstances. He's fully aware. But I think, here's the first D, you ready? We look for God in the destination, but often he is found in the detour. They thought they would find Jesus at the tomb, but he gone. I just want to say that like every two minutes. He gone. Everybody should hashtag that, anything you post today, he gone. But he ain't gone because he's really here. He ain't, he ain't, he kind of, it's kind of a dichotomy. So, so they're looking for him in the tomb. They're looking for him in a destination. But he shows up on the detour with these two guys walking toward Emmaus. What kind of God would show up to you and to me and to Cleopas and speak directly to you in crowds of thousands of people when we are walking the wrong way? You see, if Cleopas and Miss Cleopas or the other guy or whoever it was with Cleopas, if they had really believed that Jesus were going to be raised from the dead, they would have stayed. But they were downcast. They were beaten up. Here's the thing. Jesus followed them to the wrong place. Listen, because grace will chase you down. And I believe this somehow, someway, you've shown up or you've tuned in today because the grace of God is chasing you down and he's trying to tell you, you've been running, you've been detouring, you've been going all about it your own way because you've been downcast or downtrodden and you feel like giving up. And he's saying, no, no, I will meet you on your detour to show you I still love you because you're here. You've been looking for God. You've been asking God to get you where you want to go. And you've been frustrated because you don't see him. But maybe, maybe he's just right in front of you. Maybe you can't see him because you're focused on some destination. And you're on a detour away from God's purpose for your life. And he keeps trying to show up and say, I still love you. I still love you. I still love you. And you just think Jesus or God is some figurative thing that happened in history. Can I just tell you, I believe God is there in the middle of your cancer, in the middle of your chaos. He's there in the middle of your anxiety. He's there in the middle of your uncertainty. He's there in the middle of your depression. And these two men walking along downcast, thinking that their whole spiritual belief system has been shattered, he shows up to say, hey, I'm there for the parts of the journey that you didn't even plan for. He's not the God of the destination all the time. Sometimes he shows up in the detour and there are people watching today and will sit underneath the sound of my voice today and you have detoured away from the spiritual center of God in your life and you're going on a road to Emmaus away from God, away from everything else and he's trying to show up to say, hey, I still love you. Here's the second D. We look for God in the dramatic but he's often found in the details. 
He's often found in the details. See, they're looking for God to be res- resurrected. Okay, where's he at? Show us. I mean, like they, you know this because somehow, some way, if some major news event occurs, we want to link it back and say, look at how God does this and look at how God does that. Look at the power of God. Or if a celebrity comes out, talks about serving, we want to jump on the bandwagon. And sometimes God don't care about all this stuff. He cares about showing up in the intricate details of his children's lives. All that other stuff is just everything in this world revolves around the plans of God. Everything in this world happens for one reason, to glorify him. And Jesus doesn't reveal himself to them in the dramatic. They're just walking along the road and he begins to have conversations about the details of his life. And he shows up and he says, what things happened? I love this question. He's like, all right, let me play along. What happened? Listen to the grace in this statement alone. Do you know how sometimes we take stupid things to God? I just can't believe, God, you let me go through this. And Jesus is like, all right, I did hang on a cross for you. I did take 39 lashes. You should have taken. I gave my life. I never sinned. I took your sin upon my back. But okay, I'll listen. I'll listen because I care. He says, what things? And they say, about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. Notice they call him a prophet, not Lord. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Now hear me. They are standing in front of the great I am, and all they start telling him about is he was. You see, in the Old Testament, God revealed himself as the I am. I am before time. I am after time. I am in time. I am all things to all people at all times. And now all they're speaking about Jesus is in past tense. Can I, can I propose to you this today too? Some of you are missing what is because you're stuck on what was. You see, you're missing because you went through a divorce and you didn't see God in all that. And you're missing what God's trying to do in your life right now because of what happened to you. Some of you were abused as a child. Some of you went through some heartache some pain, some things in your life that were very, very hard and very, very painful and very, very traumatic, but you're missing God standing right in front of you, the great I am, because all you want to talk about is the thing in the past. And I'm not saying it's not real. That's why we have programs and facilitators and peer counselors and counseling center to help you take next steps because we don't want you to miss God right in front of you. He's with you. God is for you and he's here in the middle of your detour and he wants to show you in all the little details of your life that he still loves you. (laughs) And then they said, I love this. He said, Cleopas said, but we had hoped that that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since it took place. You see, what he's saying is the third day, we were supposed to see this miraculous thing. We were supposed to see him, like, restore Israel. We don't, but, like, he, he gone. Y'all will never forget this. <laughs> Hear me. If you had hoped for it, and you don't hope for it anymore, what you had isn't hope at all. In other words, if you, if you got to see it, to believe it. That's not really hope. Faith, the Bible says, is the substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence of things not yet seen, meaning I believe it and I hold on to it even when I don't see it. And too many people have turned their back on God because they've looked at their circumstances and said, well, I guess I have no hope. Hope is not found in our circumstance. Hope is found in Christ alone and what he's already done for us. That is it. That's all. And then they go, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. They didn't find his body. And they came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. And 
They didn't see Jesus either. Now listen, they are standing next to the resurrection and don't even recognize it. Listen to this irony. They're telling Jesus who they don't see about people who didn't see Jesus. They went there and they didn't see him. (laughs) He's like, I'm right here and y'all don't see me. You see how easy it is? If two people can see the resurrected Christ and not even recognize him, I wonder how many times God is trying to show up in our lives and we miss it. Here's the last D. We look for God in the dreams, but he's often found in the disappointment. You see, you have these expectations. We're going to go to the tomb and we're going to see something different. You have this expectation, this dream, this idea that you see somehow it's all going to work out. And God says, no, no, I'll show up on the road to Emmaus in the middle of your disappointment. They are, they're on a road to Emmaus and they have an experience with Jesus. I just wonder if today couldn't be your Emmaus Road experience. Where you've been walking away from things of God, walking away from spiritual things, walking away from God's best for your life. They're walking away from Jerusalem, the thing where God's going to take over the world. He's going to transform the world. The church is going to launch. It's going to change the world. I wonder how many people are walking on this journey, and it just seems like a dead end, just going through the motions. Can I just tell you this? Jesus spent his entire life telling people to follow him. And now he's following them, seeking them out. Because grace will chase you down. And he said to them, how foolish you are. and How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then he goes back in the Old Testament and begins to tell them about Moses and all the prophets. Next verse, and he goes on to say, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, concerning Jesus. Because you know the whole Bible points to one thing. It's a scarlet thread from Genesis to Revelation that says Jesus will redeem humanity in our fallenness. But they're in the middle of this journey. And they're downtrodden, and they're disappointed, and they're giving up. And I posted this on social media last night, and I want you to remember this. Don't judge the journey before it's over. Don't judge the journey before it's over. So Jesus walks. They approach the village, it says in verse 25, to which they were going. And Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. And something inside of them said, there's something different about this guy. You think? And it says that they urged him, stay with us because it's getting dark. It's evening. I love the excuse. You should stay with us. I wonder if they're just not like, I don't know. You think they, they, they saw something about Jesus and they realized they needed him? Or do you think they really wanted him to stay because it was getting dark and they were worried about him? I tend to think it's not because of what they said. It's actually a different motive. They're like, ah, this guy's got something going on. And in fact, you see later. Cleopas says, man, didn't you feel that fire when he was talking? So they invite Jesus in to their home or wherever they were staying for dinner. But here's what I need you to hear this Easter Sunday morning. Be careful when you ask Jesus to come in because if he comes in, he's going to take over. He's not a standby God. You see that? He's not just there in case you need him. If you really want to follow Jesus, he's going to take over your thoughts, your imagination, your relationships, your finance. We align our lives around the cause of Christ. God is not interested in being a part of your life. God is interested in changing every part of your life. And I love it. Oh, Jesus, don't even ask permission. Oh, I can come in? Okay. Let me take here. Let me take the bread. So he just sits at the, he just shows up. He's a guest in the home. He just reaches out and grabs the bread. Listen, it says, when he was there, he's at the table with him. He took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to him. Like, wait a second. We're supposed to be serving you. Can I just tell you, Jesus never stopped serving? Some of y'all need to be serving to be more like Jesus. 
And it says, Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Now pause. He breaks the bread, and the way in which in that culture the bread would have been served, he would have taken the bread, and he blessed it. And he would have opened up his hands, and he would have served it like this. And at that moment, they recognized him. Most scholars believe the reason they recognized Jesus because they saw the nail scars on his hands and they realized this is the one who saved us from everything. And he, he gone again. He disappeared. Like, can you imagine me like, it's Jesus. And then they're like, okay. So they ask each other. We're not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and opened up the scriptures to us. You see these same hands who broke the bread and blessed the bread and then served the bread. I think that's the same thing he wants to say to you. Listen, his life was broken and he understands that your life is broken. And today he opens up his arms and says, these are the arms that were spread wide on a cross for you and for me. Jesus in 3D. We see him differently. Any Friday night, night, Friday night Lights fans in the house? Come on. All right. There's this thing. Coach Taylor always said, especially when they were down at halftime every single game, he would say, clear eyes, full hearts. I don't think you get it yet. Because this ain't about football today. See, he would say, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. I just, here's what I know that happened to Cleopas that day. And Miss Cleo or whoever it was. They saw Jesus clearly. It changed everything. And then Cleopas goes, weren't our hearts full of fire? Weren't we burning inside? Hear me, when you see Jesus for who he is and he fills your heart from the inside out, you cannot lose. You can't. We don't serve a God he defeated. Death, hell, and the grave. Not a God who's dead. Not a God who's missing. Not a God who can't be found. But a God who walks along journeys that we should never be on to tell you, see me, I want to fill you so that you can finish well. So I'm going to say it one more time, and then we're going to have a response. And I want you, from the bottom of your heart, to finish it out with me. When I say clear eyes and I say full hearts, you together, you're going to say, can't lose. And then we're going to pray, and we're going to watch people move from death to life in this moment. We're going to watch people receive Christ in their life and go, you know what? I see Jesus for who he is, the one who lived and sinless life, died on a cross, was put in a tomb, and was resurrected for my sins. And I want to give him my life fully and totally surrendered to him. And I want him to fill me from the inside out so that I can battle this world and take on this world. And one day when I stand before him, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Are you ready to say it with me? Come on. Clear eyes, full hearts. Come on, would you pray with me? God, we love you today. We are grateful for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. And I pray in this moment, you'd speak to people. Their lives would be transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus who lived and died and came back to life so that we could have new life. Father, speak in this moment. Right now, when nobody looking around, when I say three, I want you to lift your hands. You say, Carl, I want to follow you with my life. I want to follow Jesus with my life. I want you to pray for me as I give my life to him. When I say three, just lift your hands all over this room or online. Let us know. I'm not going to call you out and embarrass you. I'm just going to give you some instructions. Come on. One, two, three. Today, I want to follow Jesus. Come on. Lift him up. Lift him up. Lift him up. I see him. Lift him up. I see him. Come on. Now, listen to me. If you lifted your hand, I want you to whisper these words to God. Dear God, I come to you right now asking that you forgive me of my sins, that you be Lord of my life, that you'd fill me from the inside out, that you'd help me to live for you from this day forward. Be Lord of my life. Today I call you my Savior, and I call you my Lord. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.